Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. Who is Vinny Smile Chopra? Came to the U.S. from India with $7 in his pocket, and today he has created a portfolio of over $200 million in commercial real estate. He's a CEO of five companies, acquiring and managing diverse multifamily portfolio of 3,500 units, and his team self-manage all the assets. Vinny has walked the walk with over 26 successful syndications during multiple economic cycles, including downturns over 12 years. He has built a very extensive educational academy to teach and mentor investors. Vinny, tell us about this multifamily syndication academy. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you so much. I'm really proud to really talk to everybody about this extensive multifamily academy that teaches new and sophisticated investors how to use other people's money through syndications. That has been my world, to buy apartments from 50 units to 500 units and how to select emerging markets, how to do deal analyzing, investor education, other people money, syndication blueprints, everything I have learned, I teach in this academy and over 500 lectures and also how to manage the assets also and along with lots of great templates and PowerPoints, everything. And I personally also mastermind coach all my students every Wednesday. So to reach me, Whitney, all the students have to, or investors have to just text the word learn, L-E-A-R-N, learn to 474747 or call my team at 925-766-3518. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Jeremy Roll. Thanks for being on the show, Jeremy. Thanks so much for having me. I was just telling you earlier that this is my probably one of my favorite topics in investing in life in general. So thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to have you on the show. I've heard nothing but great things and, and uh, about Jeremy and his expertise uh, in this business. And uh, Jeremy started investing in real estate uh, in 2002, uh, currently an investor uh, in more than 70 opportunities across more than $1 billion worth of real estate and business asset, assets. He's a founder and president of Roll Investment Group. His primary focus is cash flow. So thanks again, Jeremy. And uh, But give the listeners a little more about your background. And, and I've heard a little bit about leaving, uh, I think you left the corporate world and how, you know, this cash flow thing that we all talk about and what that meant to you. And, uh, but elaborate on that a little bit and give the listeners uh, some more about your background that, that has never heard of you. Sure. So um, just to keep it somewhat short. So first of all, I want to say that um, – syndications and passive cash flow investing, I just completely changed my life as an investor on the investor side of things. Um, I actually started rotating my money out of stocks and bonds into syndications on the passive cash flow side in 2002 after the dot-com crash. I was just sick and tired of two things with regards to the stock market. One is more obvious, which is the volatility. I'm really low risk, kind of slow and steady guy. And to watch it go up and down 30% in a year just was not for me. More importantly though, the lack of predictability of where my retirement funds were going to be in 10, 20, 30 years with the stock market was really bothering me the most. And so I looked at different ways to invest, came across the general syndication concept, and then kind of landed on the fact that focusing on kind of lower risk passive cash flow for that predictability, meaning a higher occupied building for more predictability, um, that was the right fit for me. So I started to invest in syndications in 02 uh, in commercial real estate is how I started. I eventually rotated all my money from stocks and bonds into cash flow between 02 and 07. And I actually didn't do that to get out of the corporate world. I wasn't planning, like, you know, I actually talked to a lot of new people who are like, I have a five or 10 year plan. I want X amount of dollars per work per year, generate Y amount of cash flow, and then I want to get out in five, 10 years. I think that's fantastic. I love hearing that actually. Um, but I wasn't really that smart about it. I just said, look, I just want more predictable returns and I want to have the paycheck. So I ended up in 2007, I had um, a lot of cash flow built up on the passive side, but at the last draw moment uh, in the corporate world at the time, I was actually working at Toyota headquarters and uh, here in Los Angeles. And so I decided to take a risk and leave. So I've been a full-time passive cash flow investor living off the cash flow since 2007. um, And that's how I got out of the corporate world. It turns out that that last draw moment was probably the best thing that ever happened to me because the cash, you know, 
it, it, the passive cash flow just completely changed my life. Wow. So you took, I mean, uh, you took all, all your investments out of the stock market and, and put them into, uh, into syndication, into the syndication model, correct? Yes, yes. And at the time, it was a mix of syndication and some other what I would call like business investing. Um, I didn't have enough capital actually built up to just say, okay, I have a million dollars. I want to make $100,000 a year and pass the cash flow at 10% and just rotate it. I didn't have that much money. So for me, I, did a, I was kind of more creative. I did a little bit of lease financing for a friend of mine who had a web hosting company and made a much higher return like that. Uh, but my main focus was really finding more passive cash flow opportunities. And now I'm much kind of, it kind of took me a while to rotate out of um, more of the, kind of I call medium risk stuff into mostly all or mostly low risk stuff. And that happened after I left the corporate world where I, where I was able to start like compounding, reinvesting and actually getting into a better mix. So it was a combination of the two. But I've been investing, in, I've invested in many syndications between 02 and 07 as well. So, you know, just so the listeners know, uh, Jeremy and I are going to hope to do a series of shows and talk about numerous things about investing as a limited partner or, you know, passive investor. And, uh, but, you know, Jeremy, maybe you could elaborate a little bit on, um, you know, why you chose the syndication model as opposed to the stock market specifically, or maybe elaborate on that a little bit, because I, I hear it all the time. You know, a lot of people that have never heard of syndication or are just scared of real estate and don't want anything to do with it, you know, but they haven't really given it a chance, but they just, you know, the stock market is just kind of what they've been trained their whole life, that that's just what they invest in. Uh, could you just elaborate on that? Sure. Yeah. So, um, there's pros and cons to investing in the stock market and in syndications. Um, for me, the huge plus was that predictability I was looking for. That was a real big motivator for me. And what I kind of concluded is that I was comfortable being passive versus active. And by passive, my definition of passive is that I'm giving up control. So I'm a small piece of a bigger deal. So I'm one of many investors pulled together, which is basically definition of the syndication. Um, and I was okay with that concept because I was so busy in the corporate world that I didn't have time to be active. So I was very comfortable going passive as long as I ended up being very well diversified. And what I've learned over the years, I got to be diversified across asset classes, geographies, and operators. That's kind of my three pieces that I try to get diversified across. Um, but the real motivator for me was kind of focusing on the lower risk, more predictable cash flow. And so having that predictability coming in, having the returns be much more predictable than the stock market, that was truly appealing to me. I would say one of the biggest cons of investing in syndications on the other side is that you know I can't go onto a computer screen, click like sell my Apple shares and have the cash in two days, right? It's very much different than that. And so that's what I was giving up. I was giving up control for diversification. Um, and I just you know went, went down a very long path and I've been going down it ever since. But it ended up being a really good fit for my personality. And that, I'd say that's one of the most important things. There's a thousand ways to invest, frankly, even in the stock market or in syndication, different strategies. For me, um, the fact that it was, I was comfortable being passive and making bets on other people and the fact that I was really looking for that more predictable cash flow. So I kind of operate in a box where I target maybe 80 to 100% occupied buildings. That's my sweet spot. You know, I have very specific geographies I target, very specific types of assets that I target, um, and even asset classes. But bottom line is, is that it, it, when you're going to be passive, you just got to make sure that you're fitting into 100% comfort level of a box that you're putting yourself into as far as your own criteria. Oh, nice, nice. Uh, you know, so you're, you're probably one of the most experienced, you know, limited partners or passive investors that I know, uh, you know, and I just thought, you know, it'd be a great time to, to speak to that, uh, to that person who's listening, a listener that says, you know, I, I really want to invest, but uh, I, I'm just not so sure that I'm ready to be that passive investor, or, you know, I just don't know where to start, don't know what I should even be looking at. And, and so, you know, maybe at a high level, we're, we'll go through those things. And then on some, uh, on some following shows, we'll try to break down these things uh, in, in a lot more detail. Uh, sure. Yeah, I would say step one, the most important thing, and I actually have conversations with new investors all the time, just networking and discussing and frankly, just helping if they have questions. And the most common thing that comes up is should someone be active versus passive? And I think that's a very important thing to think about if you're just starting, because um, so, and so let me just give examples of active and passive, just so everybody understands. So active to me is that even though some people may consider it as passive, I consider it as active. You buy a single family home, it's a rental home. You don't intend on living in it. You maybe manage it yourself. You maybe hire a third party property manager. Doesn't matter. Point is that you have control. So you can go and 
change the toilet, you can repaint the house, you can sell the house, you can mortgage it, you can refinance at any time you want, you can hire a fire manager, you have control, okay? Um, that's one way to go about it, and it actually suits certain people's personalities really well because they like having control, and there's nothing wrong with that. Then there are other people like me who are comfortable being on the passive side, but also were too busy, for example. I worked in the corporate world. Uh, I was working at Disney headquarters before my job at Toyota headquarters, very, very busy. So I just concluded there's no way I could do this active. So I ended up going down the passive path. Now, the reason why it's really important to kind of nail down the active versus passive upfront is because generally investments, we're talking, if we're talking about real estate, for example, that's generally illiquid. Okay. Meaning that again, you can't go and press sell and have your money in three days. And so, let me give you an example of what my concern is about why this is so important. Let's say that you go down the path of trying passive investing and you go into two, three, four opportunities and you stop, you say, man, I made a mistake. This is just not, I'm not comfortable not having control. This is not the right fit for me. I'm not comfortable here. Um, that's a challenge. That's a challenge for a couple of reasons. One is the more obvious one, which I mentioned was that, you know, the illiquid nature of the investment makes it such that um, you can't sell your shares for the first year, for example, that's illegal for the SEC can't flip your shares. And then after that, it's very hard to find someone to buy your shares. It could take months to do so or longer. You may not be able to find someone. And the actual value you get for your shares is very nebulous, meaning that you don't have an appraisal that you're going to pay for on a commercial building. It's very expensive. So it's a negotiation. Sometimes you have to sell at a discount. There's all kinds of challenges. And so that's one challenge, the lack of liquidity to then change your mind and get out. The other challenge, though, is that then if you're stuck in those two, three, four investments, what you haven't done is diversified properly. And to me, and by the way, I'm not a financial advisor, so anything I'm sharing just my perspective as an investor on this, but the bottom line is, is that I mentioned at the beginning, I trade control for diversification. So if I don't diversify either across properties or operators or geographies, then I'm actually taking on more risks than I need to have and that, I'm, you know, that I think you should have as a passive investor. Great example is, let's say you just invested with Madoff and then you, you didn't diversify across other people. It can really hit you hard, right? So long story short is that, um, if you both are illiquid, can't get out of uh, these opportunities you invested in, you don't, there weren't the right fit for you to begin with, and you're not then properly diversified, you've got increased risk in a bad situation for yourself, right? So I think the number one thing for people to consider right up front is should you be active or passive? You should take all the time you need to figure that out. I'm not saying you may you know, think you want to go down one path and then switch, but take enough time to seriously consider it because even with that single family home, that's also not liquid, right? You can't just go sell it in two days if you decide you want to, you don't want to be active. What happens if it's the wrong time in the market and you can't sell it? Um, or it's not the right time for you to sell it and you want to wait two, three, four years. Now you have all this money into one house and you're also not diversified because you went into one or two homes. So you, know, you got to be really careful with that point. So that's the one thing that stands out when you mentioned just beginning. I think that's very, very important. Yeah, and I, I would think you know starting as, as passive as you can uh, it was going to be a great way to start as opposed to trying to get inactive if you if you were having second thoughts at all. Yeah, that's, um, yeah. And, you know, you could put smaller pieces across more deals in passive so you could test the waters in passive a little easier. So theoretically, let's say it takes X amount of dollars to go and try that one house actively. You could spread that money across four to eight opportunities often at down payment. And then you've at least got more diversification, even if it was the wrong path for you. So that's a good point. Uh, not that I'm advocating that anyone starts actor. I mean, really, if you, the, the optimal thing is if you can figure out what's the best fit for you to begin with, obviously. Hmm. All right. So, so we've, we've talked about active uh, versus passive. We're trying to figure that out. What, what else should we be thinking about as that, as that limited partner? Or, sure. or, uh, I would say step, step two, if you're brand new and you say, okay, passive is definitely the right way for me to go. Then the question is, you know, what do I need to, to learn before I dip my toe into something? So, my recommendation there would be a couple things. Number one is, you know, take it slow. And if you can focus on one asset class first, that's probably best. So if you say to yourself, look, I like the idea of investing in apartments. I can understand them. Um, you know, they're not as complicated as self storage or assisted living, for example. So let's just focus on multifamily because that's actually very common for people to start in, in that, in that type of uh, larger building. Um, then the next step is, well, how do you learn about it? And so that's actually kind of trickier than it sounds, right? So the way that I learned and the way that I recommend is what I call opportunity exposure. Um, and so um, if you say to yourself, look, I want to invest in a one to 300 unit apartment building. And how do I look at 20 of those opportunities to like compare them all and understand them better and see the differences, then the most efficient way to do that, in my opinion, is to go onto a bunch of crowdfunding sites 
uh, online real estate crowdfunding sites and just, you know, in your pajamas, you can do this in two hours and just download 20 opportunities. Um, now, I don't know if you want to get into more detail about accredited versus non accredited investors. You've got to be an accredited investor, but assuming that most of your listeners are accredited, um, then that's actually, the, in my opinion, a really good second step. Focus on one asset class, try to really understand it well, download those opportunities, compare them all. And what you're looking to compare is both the structure for investors, whether it's a preferred return, what splits you have to give with the operator for the profits, fee structure for the operator, management fees and other fees, uh, acquisition fees, disposition fees, there's other fees. Um, and then you want to look at their assumptions and see were they uh, conservative or were they very aggressive? And do they make the numbers look better than they probably are going to be? Or do they actually look worse to build long-term relations with investors and overperform? All these things you learn over time by reading a lot of opportunities and getting what I call that opportunity exposure. When I was first starting um, back in 02, I had to go network for the, to find these opportunities because they're not allowed to be publicly marketed. And it took a lot of in-person meetings across LA and many, many nights. Um, now you can literally go on and in two hours download 20 different apartment opportunities and read them all. So it's, it's much more efficient than it used to be to take this stuff. I appreciate you putting that out. I, I've not heard anyone say that before, like going, just go to a crowdfunding site so you can just quickly look at all these things that you've never seen before and try to compare one to another and, and learn really fast that way. Yeah, I will say one thing though. So the crowdfunding sites are all different. Some of them will pull people together into a single company or LLC and then they take a portion of the profits. And you have to be mindful of the fact that that means that if you're investing in the crowdfunding sites, LLC versus directly with the sponsor or the operator, that the returns will be lower because they're a middleman. So you have to keep that in mind. Okay. That's the one quirk with like downloading stuff from the crowdfunding sites. Some of the crowdfunding sites though are just listing sites where they're not a middleman. There may be a fee just to list an opportunity and then you're going to go direct with the operator. So it's important to distinguish whether you're investing directly with the operator or through the crowdfunding um, company that they're putting together for the returns, but everything else, all the assumptions, you know, how it's generally structured, everything, you can learn all that regardless of which two ways you're looking at. How, how have you found the best way to educate yourself? I mean, it's not efficient, but for me, it was all going, I met, I went to probably two to three meetings a week for years in LA, literally. And now I was younger. I didn't have kids. I wasn't married early on. So it was a good timing for me. Um, but that's literally what I did. And I still continue to do that to today in that I, I, I actually now have a much bigger network. And so I get a lot of opportunities coming to me through my network, but I still look at opportunities all the time, see how they're structured here, you know, compare notes with other investors, networking with other investors is a great thing to do as well. And it, you can accomplish that at in-person meetings. And if you're living in a bigger city, a little bit of it online um, now as well. Um, but yeah, I literally learned this, that way that I was recommending. And, uh, but what I learned is that investing passively is truly a team sport. Um, if you want to get best access to the most deals, get feedback on what people thought about an operator, et cetera, et cetera. It's all about the networking. I can't even think of an opportunity I found that I didn't find through networking somehow. I mean, that's what it takes because most of them are not allowed to be publicly marketed. So you've got to find them. They're all private opportunities. All right. So, so now we're going to take it slow. We're going to, we're going to download all this, you know, from a crowdfunding side or from different operators. And we're going to try to learn, learn, you know, how to look at these deals. What's next? So um, I would say that once you get past that point, you really get comfortable, then I would say consider dipping your toe in the water. Now, just to be clear, I personally think, and it's one person's opinion, that we're kind of in the ninth inning of this cycle. I think pricing is high across all asset classes. And I would caution someone, it's a fantastic time to learn because you're not missing out on much, but it's a dangerous time to invest. And so, I, of course, I'm always making new investments. I'm always looking for kind of what I call unique opportunities at this stage in the cycle where maybe the pricing is a little bit unique. Um, to really attract me. But if you're brand new and you don't understand that, it's very important to understand how the cycle works. And so um, it might be worth educating yourself before you actually make an investment on where we are in the cycle, um, you know, how real estate works across the cycle, because prices go up and down across the cycle. Um, and also importantly, is that before you invest in a specific asset class you've just learned, you've got to think ahead. I don't find enough people think ahead. So in most of the stuff that I invest in, it's got a 10 year projected horizon. It could go longer, it could go shorter. And that's just the strategy that I use. But that means that I have to think way ahead. So just give you an example. In 2013 is when I started investing for a recession, quote unquote. I didn't think there was gonna be a recession in 2013, 14 or 15. I thought there was gonna be one in 2018. So what that meant to me is that I actually had to focus on asset classes that I thought would do well during a downturn. 
so that it would get through a downturn, assuming I was in there for 10 years. And so it's really important to think ahead both for recessions, but even for innovations, technology, and other societal changes coming up. So let me give you a really good example. Certain uh, states have populations that are actually growing, and some of them have populations that are shrinking. Illinois is a great example, unfortunately, of a population that's shrinking. Uh, Chicago is still really big, but the surrounding areas are shrinking. And then Florida and Texas are numbers one and two in terms of expected population migration for the next 10 years as far as influx, right, for retirees and for other reasons. And so you've got to think ahead and you kind of be smart about where am I going to be here in seven, eight years from now? Um, and probably one of the best examples I can give anybody is, you know, if you invested in a large enclosed mall 10 years ago, where are you today? Now, I'm not saying it's easy to forecast that. I'm just saying be as aware as possible about all these things and take it in consideration before you make an investment. You can't forecast everything, uh, but let me give you some examples of what's on my mind right now. So there's robots, there's self-driving cars, there's other technologies that we know are coming. What does that mean? If jobs are gonna get displaced, is there certain areas that are gonna benefit from that? Certain areas that are gonna actually have a lot higher unemployment? Um, what about self-driving cars? With self-driving cars coming up, are people gonna wanna go into an office building or they're gonna wanna work from somewhere else or is it gonna be easier for them to get to an office building? You know, There's all these questions and they're not easy to answer, but you've gotta think about them all. And even trends, like we know that, that the economy is doing really well, really well right now, but wages are not kind of keeping up with the cost of living. It's just a fact of life in terms of what's happening. What does that mean? That means that in five or 10 years from now, cost of affordable housing will probably still pretty good. The, the demand for affordable housing will probably be highly in demand still. Um, but, you know, the, so what does that mean exactly? Like if you make a bet on a class A really fancy apartment building, is that as good an idea for predictability as going into a mobile home park, for example, in the right area? I'm not trying to answer these questions. I'm just trying to point out it's important to consider these things. And I find that most people don't think far ahead. They look at what's going on with the property today, but they don't think five or 10 years ahead. That's a very important next step. Wow. No, that's, that's really, that's great. I mean, most people wouldn't be thinking about how a possible, a self-driving car or, or, you know, would affect uh, the real estate industry. Yeah, there's going to be huge changes. And, you know, whether it's in 10 or 20 years from now is not really the point. The point is that if you're at least trying to predict, you'll avoid the landmines, right? So you don't have to be right. It could be in 20 years and not 10 years from now. But if you want to reduce your risk, don't take the risk that it could happen in eight years from now. And you're in that deal still, hmm. you know, as far as trying to predict. Um, so anyway. Wow. Okay. So we're thinking ahead. Uh, what, you know, what would be the next thing you'd tell that, that LP, the limited partner, the passive investor? Yeah. So when you decide you want to dip your toe and you're going to want to find an opportunity you think is structured well, that has fair returns and fair structure and fair management fees for investors that's bought at an attractive price, right? That's at least at market rates or better. Um, and the, in this business or in this type of investing, to me, the number one most important thing is who you're making the bet on. And the number two most important thing is the property. So you're going to want to focus a lot of time on who you're making the bet on first um, and then dig into the property. Now, I would recommend that you make sure that everything else lines up high level with what you're looking for first, meaning you want to make sure that the management fees look okay and the investor splits look reasonable and the property looks attractive to you. But then I would stop there start digging in on the actual operator, get to know who you're making a bet on and whether you want to make a bet on them or not, and then shift back and look at everything else in the actual opportunity. Um, let me give you an example of why I think the operator is more important than the property. So I like to give, this is a really clear example, I think. So I live uh, in Los Angeles and I happen to live a few blocks south of Beverly Hills. And so, you know, someone could drive me five minutes away from here and say, look at this great building on Rodeo Drive. Everyone's heard of Rodeo Drive, famous street. Um, very high end. And like, we've got these five great tenants. They're going to be there for a long time, hundred percent occupied. looks very attractive for cash flow, Right. But the problem is that if I make a bet on an operator who is just runs the building to the ground, doesn't work well with the tenants and all of a sudden people start leaving. Next thing you know, the building's empty. We give the keys back to the bank and it doesn't matter that it's like the best location on Rodeo drive with the best tenant base going in. Right. So that's why who you're making the bet on because you're giving them control is definitely the number one thing for me. Um, and so you're gonna wanna try to understand who you're making a bet on, that are, are some of the assumptions they're using aggressive or conservative? Meaning are they trying to underpromise um, to specifically set low expectations for investors, overperform and build long-term relations with investors to continue to have you as an investor going in over and over? Or are they trying to be aggressive, make the numbers look really strong by using very aggressive assumptions so that the numbers are attracting you 
but that in the long term they may underperform, but they now they've got your money, they've made some other fees, but they don't really care because they're going to go get a new investor. And I'm always looking for the, um, the conservative operator who's using conservative assumptions or has the same mindset as me because I'm a conservative person. Um, and I think that's really, really key. And you can find that in some of the data, so in some more tangible items, so some of the assumptions. But the tricky part is actually reading through the lines, understanding who you're actually making a bet on from a philosophical perspective. So you have to have calls to discuss it with them to see what type of personality they are. You got to read between the lines and review in the actual opportunity and see if they purposely say that they're being conservative in certain ways and they point it out. Um, and so, and you know, in some of the assumptions that obviously they use, the numbers will tell you something about them, but you really got to dig in and actually interview them talk to them, ask them questions. And often some questions, it's more important how they answer the question as opposed to what they answer the question with for that reason. So it becomes a bit of like a, an investigation as to who you're trying to make a bet on. No, I like that. It, sometimes it's how they answer, not so much what, what they say. Yes, exactly. Uh, Definitely. So, you know, I know you said the, you know, obviously the operator is first, the property is second. And, uh, and, and I want us to get into, you know, more details, obviously about both of these things. Um, but, uh, we'll do it in another episode, but, um, but after, you know, after finding the deal and we're making sure that it's structured well, let's say at this point we've interviewed the operators and we're, we're confident in them and their ability and their track record. And then, uh, you know, we've looked at the property and, and we're going to get into that, but, uh, what's, what's after that or, or what would you say? So I say, I think once you decide that you've actually want to make a bet on this person and you want to make, actually invest in this property, then what you would do is fill out what's called, well, actually, Part of in my opinion, part of the review of the actual opportunity is looking at the legal documents, okay, and looking at the actual operating agreement for the LLC that's most typically what you're investing in. I probably shouldn't glance over it, but I, I made an assumption. You've got to read the legal documents. Um, may be annoying. It may take a lot of learning time, okay. The good news is that after a while, they become very cookie cutter and that most of them contain similar provisions from different operators. So if you get to understand the 20 things to look for, it won't be as bad going forward. The reason why it's so important to understand the legal documents and specifically the operating agreement is because it dictates the rules of, of what, you know, once you give someone else control, what rules that they have to play by as the manager. And um, if you're not reading documents, there can be some really bad things. And I'm going to give you one extreme example, which I've actually seen before, which just blew me away, which is, you know, cash calls. So nobody likes the idea that, you know, you can be forced to put money in. So most of the time, Cash call provisions are optional. They can't force you to put money in. The worst case scenario is that they'll either get a loan on the company for that difference, or they might have to dilute you, but they can't force you to put in more. That being said, they can force you to put in more depending on their verbiage. And I've seen some crazy stuff. Like I've seen if there's a cash call for any amount of money, it could be for $5, that's your share. Um, if you don't provide the money in 48 hours, you're diluted by half of your interest. I've actually literally seen that in an operating agreement before. I've never seen that. That's wow. I know it sounds crazy, but it's, it's like basically that deal was structured for the people that weren't reading the documents, right? Because no one's going to invest in that if they read the documents. And I felt bad because they were probably going to raise the money, which told me that every single person investing was probably not reading the documents. So it's critical to read the documents and understand that. Another thing that I should point out is that I always do background check on an operator before I actually move forward. And so um, I strongly recommend background checks. It saved me a number of times. Um, I, I'd say the percentage of people who do background checks in my best estimate is probably below 25% based on talking to people and probably even lower than that. Um, but it's worth the money and it's definitely important to do because you're usually investing a lot of money. Um, so once you've gone through, I mean, we can get into more detail. I don't want to kind of get too detailed, bogged down. But once you've gone through all your due diligence steps and you decide you want to invest, you're typically filling out something called the subscription agreement, which is a legal document that allows you to subscribe to the actual opportunity itself. You're filling that money, uh, that paperwork out, you're providing that paperwork to the operator along with your funding, and then eventually the deal will close and you'll get a receipt acknowledging that you've got a certain percentage ownership in the company. And then eventually, hope you'll be getting regular um, you know, checks if you're doing cash flow uh, distributions and reports. I personally won't invest in an opportunity unless there's at least quarterly check and a quarterly report. That's my own rule, so. Nice. Jeremy, unfortunately, we're about out of time uh, for this show. But uh, like I said, we're going to have you back and we're going to continue this conversation. And we're going to uh, try to dive a lot more in depth about many of these topics that we've, we've already discussed today. Um, but, you know, before we go, tell us uh, what's been the hardest part of the syndication business or process for you? Um, the hardest part. 
Um, I would say that the hardest part actually is finding opportunities, finding opportunities that you think are really good. I would say particularly at this point in the cycle, that's by far the hardest part, but the, it's just very hard to find opportunities to begin with because it requires a lot of networking. And then of course, it's hard to find opportunities that align with you well. And so hardest part for sure in this type of investing is finding the opportunities. And what would you say is the number one thing that's contributed to your success? Um, networking. Literally, I can't imagine how I would be investing like this without networking. And how I purposely have gone through quite a lot of work over a long time now, 17 years to build up a network. So it's become easier because of all the years. But the networking is definitely the, the number one key thing. You cannot do this without networking. I'm just kidding. Unless you want to just go and invest on crowdfunding sites, which there's nothing wrong with. But if you want the best of the best opportunities that align best with you, there may be some on crowdfunding sites and maybe others elsewhere. And that all comes down to networking. And Jeremy, how do you like to give back? Um, I'd say that my basic philosophy is that I am happy to have a call with anybody, um, you know, free of charge or whatever. Um, if it's a new person or not, you know, network, just questions about how all this works. I, I actually speak to numerous people every week who are brand new who just have general questions that I'm happy to help. So, and frankly, I have helped with other referrals, like really any way that I can. I've been very fortunate to end up, you know, the cash flow has completely changed my life. And so I have the time and the ability to give back in this way. So I do it all the time just because I have the knowledge and the time. So, and by the way, if anyone wants to reach me, I don't know if you're going to ask this, but I am. Um, Please go ahead. Tell, tell yeah. the listeners how they can get in touch with you. Best way to reach me is through email. So uh, J roll, J R O L L at roll investments, R O L L investments with an S.com. So J roll at roll investments.com is the best way to reach me. Great. Jeremy, thank you again for your time and, and your expertise uh, and just laying, laying this out for us. And I, I really look forward to having you back so we can dive a lot deeper into these topics. Um, but anyway, thank you again. I appreciate the listeners being with us today. I hope you all go also go to LifeBridge Capital and connect with me and go to the Facebook group uh, where you can uh, leave uh, questions for future guests uh, that are going to be on the show and uh, connect with us there, connect with with a whole network of, of other syndicators and people in the business there. And we will talk to each of you tomorrow. Thanks for having me on. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.